Welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. Recently, it came to my attention that a film based on the medieval poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is going to be released. And I would like to thank my viewers who brought that to my attention because I probably would not have known otherwise. And to celebrate the occasion, I thought I would, since I am a medievalist, that's my day job, I thought I would talk about the medieval poem, Sir Gowan the Green Knight, for anyone who might be wanting to see the film and but might want to know a little bit more about the source material. So here we go. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is a poem, an Arthurian poem from the 14th century. And just to give you guys a little bit of a taste of it, I'll do a little bit of a reading from the original. And this is interesting because the poem was written in a dialect of Middle English. Now, I want to make these distinctions for you guys. So, Old English is basically the English that was spoken by the Anglo-Saxon and other invaders uh, who came to the British Isles in the 5th century or so and until we, about 1100, which is, well, 1066 is the Norman Conquest, uh, but we sometimes just say 1100 or so. And then we enter the period of Middle English from 1100 till about 1500. These are just arbitrary lines in a way because the language didn't just change overnight, but it was slowly evolving during these times. But nevertheless, there are certain, certain big changes that did take place within a relatively short time period that do make these uh, distinctions meaningful. So, for example, uh, Middle English ends at around 1500 in large part because of something called the Great Vowel Shift. That's the Great Vowel Shift, not the Great Bowel Shift. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, but yes, yeah, so in other words, the, the vowels changed in English, which is one of the things that distinguishes English from the continental languages, the other European languages. So I won't get sidetracked into that, though, I promise, right now, anyway. Um, so, yeah, let's do a little bit of a reading from the Middle English. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is from the very beginning of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And, I, oh, yes, I was saying earlier that this is, the poem is from a dialect of Middle English that is actually fairly difficult. It's from the Northwest Midlands, which is not the dialect that became sort of the standard. If you were to look at Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, you would see that it is much easier for a modern speaker of English to understand the Canterbury Tales than to look at the uh, original version of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which most people read in translation into modern English, because this is a very difficult dialect of Middle English, whereas Chaucer's Middle English, if you were determined, you could learn to read it fairly well within a, a few weeks uh, with some help from, you know, glossary or uh, words written on the margins and that sort of thing. So, uh, but Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is a different story. It, it, it's a little bit harder. I'll give you a taste of it. I'll read the first stanza of the poem, including the famous bob and wheel. The bob and the wheel is a little technique that's used at the end of every stanza. There's a little uh, short component called the bob with one stress, and then there's the wheel, which is a little bit of a rhymed um, uh, two uh, or, or four line thing at the end of each stanza. So you'll see what it sounds like. See then the sage and the assault was seized at Troia. The Borch Britain and Brent to Brondus and Ascus. The took that the tramus of Tres and their rocht was treed for his treacheria. The trowest on earth. It was Aeneas, the Athel and his heech a kinder that see then depressed provinces and Patronus become. Well nech of all the wella in the West Elis. From rich Romulus to Rome, riches him sweeter, with great babounce that burg he biggest upon first, and nevenis hit his own norma has it new heart. Tickius to Tuscan and Teldus beginnis, Langa Berda in Lombardia liftest up homus, and fair over the French flood Felix Brutus on Moni Bancus full broad, Britain he setis with win. Where, where, and rack and wonder, be see this hat's one therein, and oft both bliss and blunder, full skate hath skifted sin. So you probably didn't understand a whole lot of that. You might have heard, though, the alliteration, 
And uh, the poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is part of the what is referred to now as the alliterative revival. And alliteration is the principle upon which Old English poetry is based. And with the coming of the influence of French and Latin, it was something that had sort of fallen by the wayside. But in the 14th century, certain poets uh, used alliteration. Uh, and so that's, this is just one of those great poems. Uh, the 14th century was actually a really great time for uh, Middle English literature. So um, what else? You know, I think it would be helpful perhaps even to talk about, before we get into Sir Gawain and the Green Knight specifically, to talk about in a general way, the development of Arthurian literature. So you have some context. Uh, there might be some historical kernel of truth to the Arthurian legends, but not a whole lot. <laughs> we do have some Welsh sources that uh, are, are kind of, in a way, uh, they're, they're their own thing. They're not necessarily, um, well, they do definitely feed into the Arthurian tradition, but that tradition, the dominant part of it, uh, looks very different from the original British or Brythonic sources. So you have uh, great medieval poems like Egodolthin, which is a Welsh poem, or the uh, various parts of the Mabinogion, which gives us a, an older, in some way, more authentic Arthurian tradition. Uh, but when uh, there are also, by, by the way, there are some historical uh, references. You have a Welsh monk, Gildas, writing in Latin in the 6th century, who refers not to King Arthur, but to a series of battles, which would later be ascribed to King Arthur, a great war leader. Uh, Nennius, and many are unsure if that is uh, the, indeed who wrote this, but there is a 9th century manuscript ascribed to Nennius, who names Arthur and associates Arthur with these battles that were fought by the native British Celts against the Anglo-Saxon invaders in the 6th century. Uh, and the, this is sort of an ongoing struggle against the Anglo-Saxon invaders that had been going on for quite some time after the withdrawal of the Roman Empire. The native British Celts were sort of left on their own to fight these Germanic invaders. So you have these um, Latin references early on, but really when we talk about Arthurian tradition, one of the most important contributors is Geoffrey of Monmouth, whose, I uh, have it here, his uh, History of the Kings of Britain is one of the most, History of the Kings of Britain, one of the most important sources in terms of the Arthurian myth as we have it today. He wrote it in Latin. He claims to have gotten a lot of his st the story from native uh, Celtic bards and that sort of thing. Um, but whatever the case, wherever his information came from, it was a vastly influential source for later Arthurian legends, such as those taken up in the 12th century by people like Chrétien de Troyes, who, was, uh, who invented Lancelot and added Lancelot to the Arthurian tradition, or Marie de France and her famous Lays, and, or Thomas of Britain. Uh, so these 12th century writers really popularized, especially in dialects of French, including Anglo-Norman, uh, really popularized the Arthurian myths, and it spread all over to all over Europe, and including uh, among the English themselves, which is sort of ironic in a way uh, when you think about it, because you have a, originally a story of a Celtic, Brythonic, or Welsh war leader fighting against the Anglo-Saxons, and he later becomes a very popular figure in England. Uh, ironic because the ancestors of the English were the ones who were pushing out the Brythonic Celts. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, these these stories were told and told throughout the Middle Ages, became very popular in the High Middle Ages, and were in a way uh, I won't even get into the very all the different uh, versions and stories and everything else, but they were given a kind of definitive form by Mallory, Thomas Mallory, in the Mort Darthur, which is another thing I have here, the Mort Darthur. So that is the, in a sense, the text that gives us the form that people will sort of recognize. Um, it's what Monty Python was essentially making fun of <laughs> in their movie. So uh, now, uh, what's interesting about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in this long tradition of Arthurian stories is that it does stand out as something of an odd thing. And it's something that I really admire among all these tales of daring and courage and chivalry and, and all of this stuff, all these tales embodying all these chivalric values like, uh, as I said, courage and courtesy and truth or troth, uh, humility, of course, martial prowess and chastity uh, and loyalty. 
So all these tales exhibit all of these ideals of European uh, chivalric society, at least what they aspired to. <laughs> the reality was something different. Uh, but the Arthurian legends became a sort of a locus for uh, an embodiment of these ideals, with Camelot being the center of it all. It's a fictional, idealized place, but nevertheless, it was sort of a stand-in for all these values. And so all these stories of heroism are told about it over the years. But Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is somewhat, I, well, it's different from many of the others in that it is self-aware. It is introspective. It is gently subversive, I would suggest. And it is humanistic. It portrays how societal ideals can conflict with each other and how we very flawed human beings are not able to live up to those ideals completely. So, with, But it is portrayed in a way that is very loving and very humorous. And so that is something that I really appreciate about this 14th century text that makes it special among all the Arthurian stories. So let's talk about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight itself, the story. And, well, spoilers for the poem. Well, it's been around for 700 years or so, but if you haven't read it yet, spoilers. <laughs> so in, in the beginning of the tale, the Green Knight enters the court of Camelot. And the Green Knight is very much related to a, a much older mythological tradition of the Green Man. He is associated with fertility myths, with sacrifice and renewal of crops after the death of winter in the greenness of spring. Uh, so he's a sacrificial figure. And you can even see the Green Man portrayed in various uh, hidden corners of cathedrals throughout the British Isles. Uh, so a very important figure, and the Green Knight is very much part of this Green Man tradition anyway. I think medieval people would have recognized the vibe here. Uh, and, but he is the other. He is the outsider. He is somebody definitely magical, outside of normal, civilized society. And he enters Camelot at an important time. It's around winter solstice. And this is a time when the veil between our world and the other world is very thin and weird things can happen. So he comes in as a challenger. And this is a, what he, his proposal is very reminiscent of some other um, challenges that are, are it's a sort of a, a, a motif or a, a common theme. You can see it also in, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this correctly, but Brick, Brick Ryu's Feast which fe features the, it's a part of the Ulster cycle of the Irish myths. Uh, so that would include the hero Cúchulín, um, who proves himself the bravest warrior by taking up this challenge of the beheading game. So the Green Knight comes in and says, hey, you guys, you're not so great. You think you're the paragon of civilization. If you're so courageous and all that, why don't you come here and chop off my head and then meet me in one year and I'll chop off yours. So that's, of course, he's a huge figure with all, all green skin and hair, and he's got a big old axe and a, a bit of a, a mistletoe or something in his other hand in token of peace, perhaps, but very, of course, in token of fertility and all of that. So he's a very interesting figure here, uh, and he is a direct challenge to civilization. He is the mysterious magical other who comes in to say, eh, you guys aren't so... Uh, tough. Let's see what you can do. So you have a very frightened group of knights and ladies um, and one of them must meet the challenge or they will all be humiliated and Sir Gawain steps up. Now Sir Gawain claims to be the least of Arthur's knights but in fact this is just a part of the chivalric ideal of humility and he is exhibiting one of the ideals by saying oh well I'm the least of your knights and let me do this for you. I'll be no great loss. Everybody knows that Sir Gawain is the greatest. So in this sense, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is, uh, is a kind of a throwback. It's a, it, it is plugged into some older Arthurian traditions. Not, there's no Lancelot. Lancelot would be the main hero in many of the later Arthurian myths. So this is another way in which Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a, a little bit different. Um, it is uh, a throwback in that sense where the main hero is Sir Gawain. And his job is, as the paragon of chivalry, is to represent the ideals that are being tested, that are being called into question. And the hero must defend civilization. And so, uh, he does so, and uh, with the result that uh, he chops off 
the Green Knight's head, and he, the uh, this entity picks up the head and says, oh, I'll see you in a year. So uh, this is, of course, a bit frightening, but this allows the festivities to continue after the Green Knight uh, trots off with his head. So uh, a year goes by fast, and poor Sir Gowan, he is human. He sweats, he fears, and we'll see even later on that he feels lust. He's a very human hero. He tries very hard to live up to all the ideals of chivalry. Mostly he succeeds, but as we'll see, he does fail because he's human. And that is something that the poet portrays with a great deal of humor and gentleness. So it's interesting because the, the year goes by and, and Sir Gowan has to go find the Green Chapel, which he doesn't know anything about. So he has to go on a quest. Uh, but it's almost as if the poem is making fun of quests because the whole quest part goes by in a couple stanzas. And it's almost Monty Python-esque in a way. You would not see this typically in Arthurian stories, but you have Sir Gowan you know, swashbuckling across the countryside, going through eerie forests and fighting giants and monsters and all of this, and it's covered in just a couple stanzas. <laughs> and it's, I think, comically so, uh, because our poet, who was really, an, uh, unfortunately, anonymous, uh, we don't know exactly, with some good guesses, but we don't really know who wrote these poems, or who wrote this poem and, and a few others in the same manuscript, but... Uh, he is really more interested in the psychology of his characters than is typical for a medieval tale. So uh, he doesn't get into the details of all the swashbuckling. He, he covers that fast. Uh, so he's interested in Sir Gowan as a human being, and he portrays him in all of his frailty, even though, yes, he's brave and, and loyal and courageous and, and uh, virtuous in, in most ways. He is tested and we see cracks in this uh, perfect night, um, which make him very human. One of the most interesting ways this happens, and, and comically, is, well, how does Sir Gowan remain courteous? Now, to uh, a woman who is a noble woman, this is one of the ideals of chivalry, courtesy. But this noble woman is trying to seduce him, and she is doing so in a way that is very overt. But Sir Gowan has to stay loyal because he has, in the midst of his travails, he has found a castle where he can stay and they're giving him shelter. And the lord of the castle, Bertilac, has become his host. And poor Sir Gowan is really looking hard for the Green Chapel because he wants to honor this agreement. But Bertilac tells him, hey, no problem. You can hang out with us. Uh, it's just a few days before the deadline, but it, the place is just a couple miles down the road. So just hang out with us until your time to come to the Green Chapel. So there he is, and he's in this castle. They make an agreement. It's very interesting how the poet weaves together these two games, the beheading game, along with this agreement that Sir Gowan makes with the host, Bertilac. Bertilac says, hey, you relax here in my castle. Enjoy yourself. You've had a hard journey. And I'm going to go out hunting for the next three days. And whatever I get while I go hunting, I will give to you. And whatever you get here in the comfort of my castle, you hand it over to me. So that's the deal. And the Lord of the Castle, Bertilac, goes out hunting. And it's interesting because you have parallel hunts going on here. You have the, uh, the physical hunt with Bertilac going out and his, his people. On the first day, they kill a bunch of deer. And they, it's described in detail. You can tell that the person writing this poem was very interested in hunting. Uh, and the second day, there's a boar that they get. And on the third day, a fox. And on each of these days, Sir Gawain is being tempted by the lady of the castle uh, who comes into Sir Gawain's room in the morning and tries to seduce him as he's lying in bed. And Sir Gawain has to fend her off. So in a way, Sir Gawain becomes the hunted as well during these scenes. And there's some great comedy during these scenes as he tries to remain courteous to her. In the end, he succeeds uh, in uh, preserving his chastity and being loyal to his host, Bertilac, by not sleeping with uh, the lady of the castle. <laughs> so uh, Sir Gawain passes this test for the most part. He hands over the kisses that he uh, gives or that he receives uh, in courtesy each day. and uh, But he is, in a way, very much parallel to the animals that Bertilac is hunting. He is like a deer in headlights on the, the first day. And the second day, uh, the boar is a bit of a reminder of Sir Gawain's imminent fate because they do cut off its head and bring it in. 
And then, of course, on the third day, there's the fox. Uh, and Sir Gawain, you'll see, tries to, mm, uh, to be clever in uh, eluding his fate on the third day because the lady of the castle, somewhat peeved that Sir Gawain keeps rebuffing her very politely, decides to say, well, why don't I give you this ring then as a token of my affection for you? And Sir Gawain said, no, 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 really, I, I can't take anything like that. I don't want to give the wrong impression, that sort of thing. But then she says, aha, well, how about this then? I'll give you this sash, this green girdle. Should have been a hint for Sir Gawain, green girdle, but oh well. Uh, I'll give you this sash, and it has magical properties. It protects anyone who wears it from physical harm. And Sir Gawain thinks, oh, I maybe could use that because I'm about to have my head chopped off. So at the end of things, he gives the host the three kisses he got that day, but he does not hand over the green girdle because he's afraid for his life because he has an appointment the next day with the green knight to have his head chopped off. So uh, it's, it's really brilliantly done, this juxtaposition of hunting scenes. And in the end, I don't know, but can we really blame Sir Gawain? for not handing over the girdle? It's an interesting question. Well, the next day comes and uh, Sir Gawain arrives. Uh, he is escorted by a young fellow, a little squire, who brings him and even tells him, hey, look, buddy, if you want to run away, it's perfectly fine. Sir Gawain, true to his courage and loyalty and his troth, his honor, decides to go through with it. Although we can tell he's very, very nervous about it, especially when he sees the Green Chapel, which turns out to be a lot like a barrow. It's a big mound. It is a portal, in other words, into the other world. It is into the magical realm of the fairy and the monstrous. So there's a lot of comedy too, as uh, he hears this hideous scraping sound, which turns out to be the Green Knight sharpening his axe on a whetstone. And uh, so the Green Knight really hams it up. He gets uh, uh, quite the effect there as he's sharpening this great, big, enormous axe, which is about to be used to chop off Sir Gawain's head. So he toys with Sir Gawain, and he even has a, a little bit of a fun while Sir Gawain's neck is on the chopping block. He takes his big old axe, and he wields it, and he chops once, but he stops just short of Sir Gawain's neck and laughs at Sir Gawain for flinching and, uh, <laughs> and all too human fear of death, which is what Sir Gawain shows then. He's, and uh, he kind of jokes around with him and says, okay, 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 all right, I'll, I'll, I'll get you. He does it again and he taunts Sir Gawain. And then the third time he gives Sir Gawain a little tiny nick, which is, it's, as it turns out, a, uh, what Sir Gawain gets for withholding the green sash. Because, ta-da, it turns out that the Green Knight is in fact Bertilak. And this whole thing is a great big setup. Behind the scenes, wielding the strings is Morgan Le Fay, the half-sister or, uh, or stepsister of Arthur, who is a magical being who is opposed to the civilization of Arthur. She is sometimes portrayed as the, the baddie behind the scenes who whose main desire is to humiliate the Arthurian court. And uh, it's interesting because she is quite the uh, subversive figure. She dabbles in the forbidden, in the uncontrolled. Uh, and she is a threat to the patriarchal order. So it's a very interesting thing, the woman being the other here. Uh, and it, it's very important because um, it's been talked about by many feminist critics, of course. Uh, but when you look at the misogyny that was very common in the Middle Ages. You kind of have to admire Morgan Le Fay for being so defiant. At any rate, uh, what we have at the end is the Green Knight congratulating Sir Gawain on being basically a pretty good hero. He, he passed the test for the most part. Yes, he failed uh, at the end in withholding the Green Girdle, but who wouldn't? It's an understandable failure. And so the Green Knight slash Bertilak is actually very sympathetic and jovial at the end and congratulates Sir Gawain on basically doing a very good job of representing the Arthurian court. And uh, so he has a bit of fun uh, and poor Sir Gawain is made fun of and feels his failure. And in his really only really bad moment, his worst moment in the story, 
as a result of being tricked by the lady of the castle and by Morgan Le Fay, he goes off on a misogynist rant, one that would be fairly typical of medieval literature, unfortunately. So uh, I'm not sure if the poet put this rant in Sir Gawain's mouth in order to show how flawed he is, uh, to show how frustrated he was at that moment. Um, but I suspect that it's there for, even though uh, there are many much more serious tales of that sort, I suspect that he put it there for more of a comic effect. In a way, he, uh, I'm saying he, we don't really know who the poet was, but the, the poet might have actually been subversive in including that because he's, he was making fun of the whole um, tradition of misogynist rants. So uh, it's an interesting question to look at, but at any rate, Sir Gawain does blame the women for his failure there. And he returns to Camelot in shame, and he wears that green sash uh, on his shoulder as a mark, as a badge of his failure, as a badge of his shame. And he tells the people of Camelot all about his adventures and uh, his failures. And here we see again the poet's humanism in response to uh, Sir Gawain and what the people of Camelot do. They embrace him, they say, you did a great job representing us, and they all decide to wear green girls as well, to take away Sir Gawain's individual shame and to share in it, to show solidarity by everybody wearing these sashes, as if to say, yes, we are all human, we all have flaws, and you did a great job representing us. And at the very end of the manuscript, a later hand, some other scribe, put in the motto of the Order of the Garter. And I think it's in response to this very humanist message here. The motto of the Order of the Garter being, Oni soit qui mal le pense, which means something like, shame on those who think ill or evil of it. In other words, don't judge. Let's embrace our humanity and, yes, strive our best, but not be too hard on ourselves. So we see at the very end of Sir Gowan the Green Knight that it is, a, it is very much a humanist poem. It is written by someone who I suspect was very clever, very observant, and much like this poet's contemporary, Geoffrey Chaucer, was an observer of humanity. So I don't know what the film is going to be like, if it will include any of these observations about humanity, any of the psychological depth or the humor that the original, uh, its source material has. But I'll look for those things, and perhaps they'll be there in the film. I look forward to watching it, and I look forward to your thoughts on Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and perhaps hearing what everybody thinks of the film as well in the future. Thanks for watching, and until next time.